Here we go. That's not what I meant to do. There we go. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six. All right. One of you's not watching the slideshow, but I'm going to go ahead and get started, though. Alrighty. Oh, wait, hold on, let me pull this up real quick, I apologize. Alright, so, welcome to my Bailey Bridge TED Talk. Um, obviously, I'll be talking about Bailey Bridges, but also I'll be talking about uh, modern military bridging. Um, including, you know, its history and its place today and in the future a little bit. Um, I'll be using some specific one specific example from World War II, the Battle of Monte Cassino, um, just to kind of highlight the value of Bailey Bridges. And then I'll talk about modern float bridges and their operation. And then after, after that, I'll talk about um, some recent events in Ukraine. Um, I decided to add a pretty sizable chunk to the presentation to cover the recent bridging operation in Ukraine by Russians. Um, and then I'll talk about, I'll do my best to talk about their tactics from what photographic evidence we have and what possible mistakes they made which caused their mission to end in such catastrophic failure. But before I go into all that, um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been in the Army Reserves for about seven years. Um, I've done quite a few things, but the main, I guess, um, thing I want you to focus on, I was a 12th Charlie, a bridge crew member for three years. That's primarily what's been um, has given me the information and the knowledge to give you this presentation. Um, I primarily was a pinman and a BEB operator or bridge direction boat. I was basically a boat driver. Um, and I'll go into those positions later on. Um, I also cross trained, so I did uh, shore operations as well, as well as uh, build crew on the float bridges. Um, and then I also trained to construct Bailey bridges and operate the DSB. I was planning on talking about the DSB, and I know in the event description I said I would, but I decided to cut it out because um, it isn't vital, and the uh, I felt like it was just going to be too long. Um, so I do have, I actually have two disclaimers. Firstly, I have not been deployed or built bridges outside of a training environment. So if that adjust, like changes how you want to take the information that I have or am about to present, that's completely okay. I just wanted that disclaimer out there so you guys can decide for yourselves. Second thing is that um, I have built, my primary focus in the military was building float bridges. Bailey bridges and the DSB were, um, I was trained on and I have knowledge about, um, but I have not operated them as extensively as the float bridge. But I have done a lot of research and you'll see that in this presentation. Does anyone have any questions before I continue? I'll take that as a no. All right, so purpose today. Actually, I do. I do. Yes. Cross training as a bridge crew member or the other MOSs that I had? Yeah, the other MOSs. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. So I'm guessing currently you're primarily a bridge and you cross train from those three others, or how did that work out? So when I first enlisted, I enlisted as an aviation operations specialist. Um, and then shortly after I graduated from AIT, I transferred to an engineering unit where I was slotted as a 12 Bravo. Um, after that, I was reclassed to a 12 Charlie, which I spent the most time on, um, as. And then after that, I transferred back to Houston, where I am currently a Black Hawk maintainer. Um, and then it's looking like I will be going back to 12 Charlie um, after the end of this year, but we'll see. Did I answer your question? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, cool. All right, so our purpose today. So we're going to be talking about the Bailey Bridge, obviously, the historical value using the Monte Cassino example. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how the Bailey Bridge fits into modern you know, warfare. And then I'll talk about the float bridge and its operation. And then we'll talk about 
um, Russia falling flat on its face. And then I'll have a uh, work cited at the end if anyone wants to see that. And I can provide any sources that I had um, or that I used to make this presentation. So let's see. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is terminology. Um, I felt this was pretty important because I'll be using a lot of these like acronyms and terms a lot in this presentation. So I thought it would be a good idea to make sure you guys understand what they mean. First thing is gap. Um, literally anything you're crossing with a bridge, a military bridge is called a gap. It could be literally anything, but if the bridge is going over it, it is the gap. Um, next is near shore. So this is usually for uh, float bridges, but it can also be for just any other bridge. Um, near shore is the side that you're on. It's usually a starting point. So this is where you're basically the friendly side of the gap. The far shore is the opposite shore. Um, just it's basically usually the enemy side, and it's usually where you're trying to get to by building a bridge. Next, we have wet gap and dry gap. Wet gap, oops, sorry. Wet gap is essentially anything with water that you're crossing. River, lake, literally anything with water. Dry is anything that does not have water, canyon, ravine, etc. Um, next is IRB, improved ribbon bridge, um, which is basically the float bridge. Um, so I'll be using float bridge, improved ribbon bridge, IRB pretty interchangeably. This next one, BEB, I, I don't believe I'll be using this very much, but I thought it was also a good one to have. Um, this is basically the boats um, combat engineers use to build float bridges. And then you have the CBTs. Um, the CBTs are right here. You can see in this picture, uh, the camo truck part, that is the CBT. That is the HEMTT like variant uh, for bridge operations. Then you can see this tan part right here. This is what's called a BAP or a bridge adapter pallet. It basically holds the bridge bay and this weird green colored thing, that is the actual bridge bay. Um, just so you guys kind of understand that. We'll go into a little bit more later on, but um, these are all separate parts. Uh, fun fact, bridging units in the military are actually multi, are called multi-role bridging companies. Um, once they are used in their bridging capacity and they don't we do, the military doesn't need them for that capacity anymore. They can be transferred to be a transportation company, which is why they're called multi-role bridging companies. Just a little fun fact. Um, all right, so getting into the Bailey Bridge. So the basic premise for the Bailey Bridge was to bridge a gap in crossing operations that could support all the equipment in the British arsenal, and preferably without the need for heavy heavy equipment. Um, early in the war, the British had other bridge, bridges which were suitable for um, what they had, but they introduced the new tank called the Matilda, which was at least 23 tons. So there was a gap in their bridging capacity and the weight of their newest tank. So they obviously had to develop some adjustments to their existing bridges, but then they introduced a tank called the Churchill, which was about a 40 ton tank. And at that point, you cannot, they couldn't adjust their bridges to handle that kind of weight. They had to create a new bridge. So this man, Sir Donald Bailey, um, he was in charge of creating bridges for the Brit British military. And he was testing some designs that were failing. And one day after a design failed, he drew up a sketch for the Bailey Bridge um, on the back of an envelope. So remarkably, what's crazy is after the, between him drawing that sketch and the bridges being used in combat operations was about 10 months, which for a military program is a really quick turnaround. Um, another fun fact, Sir Donald Bailey, I call him Sir Donald Bailey because he was knighted in 1946 uh, for his contribution to the war effort with the Bailey Bridge. Any questions about the development of the Bailey Bridge? Okay. So why was it so great? Firstly, you only need a maximum of six men to carry the heaviest pieces. Um, these pieces could be uh, carried anywhere they were needed. It, this alone makes it easier to create the bridge and cross gaps that wouldn't have been previously possible. You could also, um, the weight also allows the pieces to be carried by standard British trucks. So you didn't need, you know, heavier trucks to carry big heavy pieces. Second thing is that it's easier to assemble, relatively speaking. Um, obviously, anything's difficult to assemble in like a combat scenario, but you didn't need special skills, so no welding was required. You didn't need any complex knowledge of 
bridging or bridges. Um, literally, I built a Bailey bridge. If I can do it, anyone can. Um, all you need are a few hand tools, like wrenches, uh, mallets, things like that. It was also really flexible, and we'll cover that a bit um, a bit later on as well. But the strength could be adjusted as needed, depending on how far the Bailey Ridge was going, like how far the gap was, and then what kind of weight it was expected to support. So if you're expecting tanks, or maybe you're just expecting trucks, you can use that to kind of decide how you're going to construct it. So as a side note, Bailey Bridges were used in pretty unconventional ways. There were some pretty standard like sets, like triple doubles, triple singles, things like that, and I'll go over that in a bit. But um, there were really weird ways that they came up with using Bailey Bridge parts. Like they would create these massive, tall bridges that could support a lot more weight than just regular Bailey Bridges. And I even saw a picture where they created a suspension bridge using Bailey Bridge parts. So the flexibility of the Bailey Bridge is no joke. Um, as I mentioned previously, it could also support all Allied vehicles, um, no matter what nation they were from. Um, though the Soviet Union did not, from what I could find, use the Bailey Bridge all that much, if at all. Um, it was also really easily manufactured. It didn't draw anything away from other parts of the war effort, um, especially aluminum. That was a big part. The pieces needed to be light, but they could not use aluminum because they needed them for the um, production of airplanes and bombers. So a lot of these factories that built the Bailey Bridge were literally building things like canoe paddles or furniture or other basic commodities. But the Bailey Bridge was so easy to manufacture that they could switch over pretty quick and um, start pumping out Bailey Bridges. So this alone just made Bailey Bridges so versatile and it was why it was so easy for the Americans to also adopt the design later on. So Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, if you guys know anything about World War II, you probably are familiar with this guy. He took over uh, British forces in North Africa and kind of turned the war around there for them um, as Rommel was kind of moving east toward um, the Suez. So Montgomery would lead British forces in Africa, Italy, and um, in Europe, and he had a lot of things to say about the Bailey. And um, the fact that World War II was very big on maneuver warfare, this was extremely important, especially if you didn't want to allow the Germans to kind of reconsolidate and create uh, new lines of defenses. Going quickly was really important. The Bailey Bridge kind of, um, what's the word, uh, facilitated that movement. So as a summary for Bailey Bridging in World War II, there were about 2,500 of them that were constructed in Italy alone, and 2,000 across all the other theaters. Again, the only theater that I can find that the Bailey Bridge wasn't used is like the Eastern Front by the Soviet Union, but it was used in the Pacific, in Africa, um, but largely used in Italy and um, the Western Front in France. So, any questions about the general kind of history of Bailey Bridges? Okay, perfect. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry, say that again. You are, but I, like I said, you, you can be muted, but if you have questions, you know, I'll try to fit those in. The first conception was around in late 1940, and then first use was in Africa in 1941. What was his inspiration? There wasn't really an inspiration. I think um, it was basically largely based around truss bridges, which is, um, I'll go over that the pieces uh, in a moment, but um, they're basically like a standard type of bridge. And there's another bridge that the British use, I forgot what it's called, but it used similar pieces, but it wasn't able to be combined or like strengthened as flexible or flexibly as the Bailey Bridge. So, um, yeah, D does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Was there another question as well? Yes. Okay, sweet. All right. Uh, what's yeah. the max weight a Bailey Bridge can hold? I will go over that in just a moment. Any other questions? All right, sweet. So I'll be going over the Bailey Bridge parts next, 
Um, I will keep this part as short as I can because while I do enjoy this part um, and I have a passion for it, I know it could be boring to a lot of other people. So, but I do want to point out that, and I know a lot of you guys have seen this because you were here when I first did the uh, the little Bailey Bridge thing in Battlefield Five. If you go and take a look at it after this presentation, you'll just notice how detailed it is. And whoever did it at Dice needs big props and probably should go to a better developer. So, Bailey Bridge parts. So first part you have Maybe, is uh, only thing that Dice got right. Yeah, exactly. So. Significant pieces. So we have the panel right here. This is, I guess, the most significant part of the bridge. It's the side pieces. Um, if we go here, hold on one second. Right here, these are the panels. These are the side, um, basically form the basic uh, strength of the Bailey Bridge going across the gap. Next, you have the bracing frame. Those go across on top of the panels and hold the panels together if you have a different configuration. Now you can only have, you, or you can have just one panel, so you won't need the bracing frame. But if you have two or three, you will need the base, bracing frame, and I'll go over those uh, configurations in a moment. Next you have the uh, transoms and transom clamp. The transoms are my absolute favorite, simply because when I was trained to build the Braley bridges, they were just generally the most fun to kind of like put into place. Um, Obviously, speed was key, and being fast with the transoms was super fun. You have also have the transom clamp, which basically holds the transom to the panel. So you have the transoms here, and you have the transom clamp right here that holds it uh, holds it down and connects it to the panel. Next up, we have the end post, which is basically right here. These are different from all the other posts because they go, obviously, at the end. Um, at the bottom, you'll have hooks here which will basically connect onto the bearings and hold the bridge in place once it's settled. Or built, I mean. Um, next we have the sway braces, obviously, to prevent the bridge from twisting, turning, and swaying. Um, these are the crossing things right here, and you'll see those in Battlefield 5 as well if you take a look. And then lastly we have the rocking roller, and which is right... where'd it go? Oh, I, I don't think it's here. But uh, we'll see that in a moment as well. But the rocking roller is basically used to construct the bridge, and the bridge will be rolled out across the gap, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. Um, we also have the stringers right here. These are the floor of the bridge. And then on top of that, on top of the stringers, you'll put wooden pieces called chesses. Now, later on in the war, they switched over to steel decks because the tanks would kind of rip up the wooden chesses. Um, so they switched over to steel a little bit later. Um, interestingly enough, you'll see right here on the transoms, these little marks right here, these are stringer lugs, and those are what the stringers will sit on and hook onto. And you can see that in Battlefield 5 as well, so that's crazy. Uh, any questions about these bridge parts? Okay, no problem. Have a good day. All right, sweet. No problem. Any questions about Bailey Bridge parts? All right, sweet. So next up, we have the Bailey Bridge configuration. So the weight configuration, this is what Fierce was asking about. You have a single single, obviously only about 10 tons. You could probably get trucks across and infantry. Um, you have double singles, triple singles, double double and triple double. Um, a triple double would be about what you would need for modern main battle tanks. Um, Anything else would probably not be a, would probably collapse with the like an M1 Abrams crossing over it. Um, and I will say just as a disclaimer as well, the triple double I could not find actual weight numbers for the triple double, but I did try to calculate as best as I could, and I came up with um, a little bit higher than 105, but I kind of lowered it just to be safe. So this should be pretty accurate, but just you know it's approximate. And for my own calculations, I don't have anything official on the triple double weight capacity. All right, next. So um, we have the Bailey Bridge. I want to go over this because it's important um, and you'll see why in a little bit. So obviously the prior three minutes of this video was just them clearing the bridge site. Um, you guys can see the video, right? I'm assuming you can. Okay. Yeah. All right, sweet. So you have the panels right here, obviously six man carry. On these trucks, easily, you know, carryable. You have the carrying handles. They're moving them around. Um, obviously, they are heavy, but six men can carry them. 
Um, I hope you guys are look at these sexy British engineers. Yeah, the transoms um, held also by the carrying handles. We actually use uh, transom clamps to kind of, or not clamps, but they're like uh, little clamp things that you can carry with it. Uh, those before you saw those are uh, the pins. They basically hold all the panels together. These are the rocking rollers. They're going to build the Bailey Bridge on top of these and then use the rollers to kind of push the bridge out, and we'll see that in a moment as well. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Let's see, more panels, more panels. All right, so they're putting together Bailey Bridge. They're obviously making a uh, probably a double-double here. Um, they'll put the panel up. Now, you can see that they're, they have this set up at the front, and what they're going to do is they're going to push the Bailey Bridge. And this was what was cool about the Bailey Bridge. As you built it, you would push it out using human power. You could use uh, like tractors or things to push it as well, but you could do it by hand. And it's actually surprisingly light. Um, like I said, we mentioned complete just hand tools. You don't need anything, you know, big welding, anything like that. Skip ahead a little bit more. Oh, here we go. So they're about to push the bridge into, oh wait, no, maybe not. More mallets, more mallets, transoms, sexy transoms. All right, here we go. So they're pushing the Bailey Bridge into place, or not into place, they're building, they're pushing it out as they build it. And this is what's called the bullnose. So it, it doesn't have any stringers on it or anything like that. Um, it's literally just there to act as a way to get the rest of the bridge across. Um, once they push it in, they'll continue uh, building, and they'll push it out a little bit more. They'll continue building and push it out a little bit more. We'll keep going. More pins. These hold the uh, panels together. More of a bull nose. And once they get it across, they will... Um, once they get it across, they'll put all the chesses on top of the, uh, the transoms and the panels and just kind of set the floor of it once they get it across. And that is about it. So, um, as you can see, you can see that they built up the back of it, and then the front of it's pretty bare. The reason they do that is because they need a counterweight to hold down the weight so it doesn't just, like, tip over into the gap. All right, and that'll be about it. Does anyone have any questions about this video or how it's constructed? Um, how long does it take to... Um, it depends on the length um, and obviously the scenario. Um, if you're in a combat situation, it's going to take longer. Um, we built a about, I'll say, if you guys can see this, about a five panel Bailey Bridge in about two to three hours. And we were doing that as we were learning when I first built it. So um, it can go pretty fast if the engineers are decently enough trained. Um, and obviously that vary, that would vary from unit to unit. So does that answer your question? Okay, sweet. Any other questions? All right, sweet. Now, the reason I showed you this video is because I want you guys to see what it's like, what it, what goes into building these Bailey Bridges. Obviously, they're not exactly being contested here, but in the next example that I'm about to give, um, it was definitely very contested. So, uh, oops, come on, there we go. All right, Operation Diadem. I'm going to let you watch this little video as I kind of go over Operation Diadem real quick. So throughout the beginning of 1944, the war in Italy um, was largely centered around the fortified German positions in Monte Cassino. At this point, Italy had surrendered, so it was just mostly German soldiers um, and German units uh, defending northern Italy. Um, so in multiple offenses dubbed the first, second, and third battles of Monte Cassino, as well as the landings at Anzio, um, Allied forces were pretty much not able to break German lines and take the town. So in 1944, and uh, I think it was around May, I believe, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll confirm the date in a second. But in a much wider offensive, uh, conduct oh yeah, yeah, it conducted in May 1944, um, British, Indian, U.S., Free French, Polish, Canadian, New Zealand, Moroccan, and South African forces conducted a massive attack on enemy forces, which eventually resulted in the capture of Monte Cassino and the liberation of Rome. And we'll go deeper into that in just a moment. Um, any questions on that? Well, 
Actually, no questions yet. Um, I'll go deeper into it and then I'll ask about questions. So, Operation Diadem. Obviously, right here, you have the Gustav Line. This is the main German defensive line um, in Italy right now. You have Rome up here, and you have the landings at Anzio right here. So, right here, you have the Gustav Line. Behind it, you have the Hitler Line, which was renamed the Seeger Line a little bit later on in, the con uh, in this battle. You have Free French Corps right here. You have the 2nd U.S. Corps down by the coast. You have British units and Canadian units down here in the middle, and you have Polish units that would push into Casino from the north. At, right here, you have British and American forces that landed at Anzio a little bit earlier in the year. Unfortunately, because of a, um, the U.S. general that was in charge of forces here was a bit too cautious, and he lost the element of surprise and wasn't able to make much of this. And... Um, unfortunately, because of this, they weren't able. To, German units were able to set up a defensive line around this pocket and contained U.S. forces there for the time being. So, um, oh, also, if you have, if any of you have watched Band of Brothers, um, the night before they jumped into Normandy, there was a scene where Sergeant Garnier uh, found out that his brother was killed in Monte Cassino. But from what I could gather from my research, he was killed. He wasn't killed in the fourth battle. He was killed earlier on um, in one of the first offenses at Monte Cassino or the Battle of Monte Portia, which kind of preceded the battles of Monte Cassino, um, which would be somewhere down here. Just as a kind of another fun fact. So the general purpose of this operation was British, Indian and French forces and U.S. forces would push up through here with Canadian armored support through the Lira River Valley. And I'll be talking about the Lira River Valley quite a bit, so just remember that. It's right here, right down the middle. Polish and British units would help kind of take the mountain at Casino. We'll talk about that in, um, in a moment as well. And at the same time, U.S. forces in the Anzio would try to push out and push toward the city of Valamontoni, I think that's what that's called, and the Caesar Line, and hopefully cut off German lines of communications, supply, and stop them from retreating, um, and obviously hoping that they're able to break these defensive lines. Now, the difference between this battle and previous battles is that it was just a generally much wider operation. So it's going to put a lot more pressure on um, German defenses and hopefully cause a, a breakout. Now, I have a 3D kind of picture of Monte Cassino here. You have the hill um, at the top, which you have the abbey, which is basically a fortress for the Germans. You have the town of Cassino right here. And you have the Lira River Valley right here. Right here, you have the Rapido River, um, which was pretty significant uh, defensive line for the Germans. Now, the point was, um, just I, the point of this picture is basically I want to show just how dominating Monte Cassino is. I mean, by Monte Cassino, I mean the mountain. Um, there was in the previous attacks, there was a New Zealand unit that tried to take the uh, Monte Cassino and were essentially wiped out to a point where um, they were incorporated into other British units and weren't exactly like considered as like an independent large unit. Um, now, nothing comes close to Stalingrad in the World War II, but out of all the European battles the Allies had to fight, um, as far as like the Western powers goes, Monte Cassino was as close as they came to Stalingrad. Um, in fact, the first battle of Monte Cassino, an American infantry officer um, wrote later on that, um, and I quote, I had 80, 184 men. 48 hours later, I had 17. If that's not mass murder, I don't, I don't know what it is. So the German lines here at Monte Cassino were brutal. Um, they were very, very well fortified and were some of the best units the Germans had. Um, the, in fact, the Abbey was actually controlled by the 1st Panzer, uh, not Panzer, um, Fallschirmjäger Division, which was one of the best um, airborne units that the Germans had. So, next picture, um, I want to show what we have here, which is the uh, view from Monte Cassino. This is the river, Lira River Valley, and as you can see, the view is dominating. Um, you have a lot of flat land down here. And any German artillery observer is going to see if there's a push going on in column artillery strikes. It's, it's strategically important. It's just, it, it's, it's, it dominates the landscape. 
Um, and the Germans used their artillery very effectively in this battle. Um, up here you have the uh, some India Indian units pushing through the Monte Cassino after the battle. And as you can see, the town of Monte Cassino was essentially razed. It was pretty much entirely destroyed. So the Germans had the high ground. They had um, just a general... They had the advantage of the Rapido River as a defensive line and obviously the defense they had constructed in the previous five to six months. So the Bailey Bridge in action here. So right here along the Rapido River, um, if you guys can see that, you'll see a bunch of little names, Amazon, Blackwater, Congo, London. These are all crossing sites. And I want you to note this just for future reference. There are multiple crossing sites and this is going to be important. Um, the Braley Bridges, uh, or sorry, the Indian and British engineers that would construct these multiple bridges would um, allow the formation of bridgeheads. The 78th British 1st Canadian Armored Brigade and the 5th Canadian Armored Division would force a breakout through these bridgeheads and push up the Lira uh, River Valley along with uh, Indian and U.S. forces, as long as with the, the French forces pushing up the mountains on the other side of the Lira River Valley. So the Germans had been holding back a panzer division near Rome um, because they were actually under the impression that there would be another naval invasion somewhere in that area. So had this battle gone on a little bit longer, Field Marshal Kesselring, which, who was in charge of German forces, would have eventually committed his reserves. So these Bailey Bridges um, were vital in pushing through Allied forces into the Lira River, River Valley. If they had delayed, or if they had not used Bailey Bridges, they would not have been able to get these armed forces across, or if they would have, it would have been very slow. And with slowness, is it's just going to allow the enemy more time to react, and there's no doubt that Kesselring would have committed that Panzer Division and pushed the Allies back once again at Monte Cassino. Now, I do want to point out that this battle was largely because the very next month, the allies allies would be landing at normandy and generals wanted to basically have like a uh, distraction um so german forces wouldn't feel comfortable to move forces to france so they needed a distraction and this operation was essentially that that distraction any questions about this operation so far Okay, no problem. I I'm still recording, so um, you can watch back later if you're if you're not going to be here. All right. Thank you for coming. All right. Any other questions? All right. Sweet. So um, I do want to point out. So Bailey bridges were were simply a cog. They're a very small piece of this operation, um, but they were very important. Um, Everything depended on this one cog. Uh, you know, it's it's a bottleneck, essentially. Um, whenever things go wrong in, in a military operation, there are often things that can make up for it. Nothing ever goes to plan. And not everything has to go right for a military operation to be successful. But in this case, the one thing that needed to go right are the Bailey Bridges. If they didn't exist, if they weren't there, if they didn't have enough of them, this operation would not have been successful. So just as a... Um, as a reminder that Bailey Bridges were vital in this, um, in the Allies' like war effort. So, I'm going to talk about, ooh, hold on, I'm going to talk specifically about the Amazon crossing right here. So, British engineers um, and Indian engineers were building a lot of these bridges. So, you have this picture right here. This is obviously a slight dramatization, but it's hard to visualize building a Bailey Bridge in a combat scenario, but this image gives you a pretty good idea. Um, now, as you're building these bridges, you're going to be under constant fire. Um, but the Allies, uh, fortunately, had pretty effective counter-battery fire to keep um, enemy artillery from disrupting the operations too much. But I want you to keep this in mind again. Counter-artillery fire. Artillery suppression is extremely important in these crossing operations because guess what you're in a, you're building a bridge in a singular singular location that makes you a target so that suppression is extremely important i want you to remember that for later um so 
if you still doubt how, you know, like how contested these crossings were, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit story about this tractor right here at the bottom of the picture, bottom right. So on, at the Amazon, they use this tractor to kind of help push the bridge across the wet gap. Um, now, in the middle of the night, as they're building this, the tractor eventually gets peppered with shrapnel and just stops working. So the fact that the tractor back here is gets peppered so much that it stops working is just another testament about to how contested this crossing was. Now, eventually, they would bring in bring in a Sherman and help, um, or allow allow the Sherman to kind of help finish the job and push the bridge across. Um, but again, these crossings are very contested, and the fact that the Bailey Bridge was so easy to construct, as far as like relatively speaking, was extremely important. Because if you have another, uh, if you have a complex bridge to build, you're not going to be able to make these contested crossings at all. Um, and in the end, um, just for this one bridge, 17 British sappers would be killed and 57 wounded. Just this one crossing. Um, so again, just as a reminder that these bridging operations are extremely dangerous, but still extremely valuable. Um, a little bit fun fact, um, right here you have the stringers that are stacked here. Uh, those were used as a counterweight because you have this long bull nose going across and you need weight to kind of keep the bridge down as you push it across. Just, you know, another little fun fact. So, the results. Uh, the operation began May 11th. Um, on 12th of May, engineers crossed the Rapido River um, and engaged, started engaging the Gustav defensive line that we discussed earlier. Um, Moroccan forces outflanked German positions and German defenses began to collapse because of it. And I'm going to be talking, there's a little star there, I'm going to be talking about the Moroccans a little bit later and um, I'll explain why. So the British units also began attacking Monte Cassino as the Polish units had already engaged those defenses. Um, and just to kind of explain how difficult it was to attack the Abbey um, at the top of the hill, the tanks that were pushing up uh, were essentially used as cover. And I'm talking like, as they pushed up, um, they would, engineers would go under these tanks and demine the road as they as the tank kind of pushed up. Um, and I'm talking like, essentially tanks were firing at literally every rock and every bush as they pushed up. Um, and eventually there was a story, I'm not, I can't confirm the story, but um, once they had captured the abbey, the Germans had retreated in the middle of the night um, and left kind of the more severely wounded that they couldn't evacuate. And they were asked why um, they held on for so long and so fiercely. And the Germans said that they thought they were told or they were in, under the impression that Polish soldiers didn't take prisoners um, just because of how they were assaulting. I, obviously, I can't confirm this and if it's real, um, but just it's, it's a testament to how difficult it was and, um, for Polish units to take the Abbey and um, just kind of testament to their skill. Now, I do, um, oh, okay, let me finish this real quick. So 23rd of May, um, Allied forces began to push out of the Anzio and uh, kind of push east to attack as the uh, Allied uh, attacked the Singer line. Um, this was originally the Hitler line, as we discussed. Hitler ordered it renamed because he didn't want um, the propaganda backlash of the quote-unquote Hitler line being overrun. So this is probably the most unfortunate part of this operation is um, that this breakout from Anzio was successful. However, um, General Clark, who was kind of commanding that, that force, ordered a change in direction to go north toward Rome because he wanted to be the first in Rome. This basically allowed German forces to retreat from the Hitler line up the river, Lira River Valley and essentially do a fighting retreat up north where they would kind of regroup at what was called the Gothic line and would essentially just prolong the war in Italy and it would be extremely bloody. So that one decision definitely caused a lot of hurt later on. Um, and it was extremely unfortunate because the Allied ha allies had a chance to essentially annihilate the German army in Italy right there. Now, this next part um, is I, I was debating with myself whether I should, what I should do about this. 
because through my research, I wanted to include all of the forces. Uh, if you've noticed, I haven't just talking about the British and U.S. forces. I've talked about the French. I've talked about the Polish, the Canadians, the Indians, New Zealand, um, and I've talked about the Moroccans. And I do that because I think that every nation that contributed to the war effort should be recognized. Now, in the Moroccans were extremely brave, were extremely skillful, and obviously, as I said, the Moroccans were vital in turning the tide of this battle when they outflanked German defenses. But I can't sit here and um, praise them for their bravery while not letting you know and just kind of brushing aside their actions after this. Um, so first we have the Gooms Moroccans. These, these were basically tribal men, um, tribal warriors from Morocco. Um, they were irregulars. Um, they weren't, I guess, in actual military units, but they were organized in like company battalion sized units. And they were extremely skillful, extremely ferocious. However, after this battle, um, they participated in a mass rape of about 2,000, over 2,000 local Italians. Um, it was in inhumane, it was irreprehensible, and like I said, it'd be extremely irresponsible of me to kind of give you the impression of their bravery and all this kind of stuff while not letting you know about this. Um, approximately 600 would be eventually executed or imprisoned because of this. Um, and there was an effort to kind of limit their involvement or just end it completely in the war effort, but um, they would still continue to participate and would rape and loot again in Germany um, when the war ended um, for a short while. So it's an extremely unfortunate part of this war, especially unfortunate that um, they were fighting alongside the Allies who were fighting to liberate Europe from Nazi Germany. Um, however, um, I do want to point out again, um, or not again, but I want to point out that the Gooms Moroccans weren't the only ones there. Um, there were actually a minority in the Moroccan and um, North African French force. Um, you had the Trialiers, I'm pretty sure I'm butchering this, um, Moroccans, who were basically the regular forces from Morocco. Um, these were colonial troops under the command of French commanders, and they were completely separate from the Grooms Moroccans. And it would be, again, extremely irresponsible of me to give you the impression that Moroccan forces were these looters and rapists while not making the distinction between them and the Trialiers Moroccans. Um, they would continue to fight. If you guys uh, have played the war stories in Battlefield Five. Um, one of them was about the Trialier Moroccans. Actually, they, they could, it could have been um, French Algerian forces, but I believe they were Moroccans. Um, so it just, again, I think we, this is, history needs to be about all aspects of it as no matter how um, awful it is. But um, I think it's important that you guys understand um, everything about it rather than just nitpicking kind of the, um, the good parts. So, does anyone have any questions about um, Operation Diadem or the Moroccans or anything about it? Okay, sweet. So, moving on, a little bit more positive note, talking about the Bailey Bridge today. So, the Bailey Bridge isn't used as extensively anymore. Um, there really hasn't been a need for it. Um, their most conflicts have been more uh, focused on guerrilla warfare, regular warfare, um, and just the conventional wars have not been prevalent at all. So Bailey Bridges have kind of taken a back seat since World War II, but they are still extremely important. Um, they have been used in uh, the Middle East. Uh, one of my friends that I reclassed with, uh, he was deployed to Syria where they were building a Bailey Bridge. Um, and it's the flexibility and durability is just unmatched. So it, it is going to remain a part of um, a, as a tool for the U.S. military, though it's not going to be as prevalent as it was in World War II. Um, it's still extremely 
um, effective for civilian relief, um, especially in like areas like the Middle East where um, you have roads or bridges destroyed by uh, insurgents and you might want to rebuild. Um, they're also very low maintenance, which helps when you have um, governments like in the Middle East that maybe don't exactly have the resources to maintain larger, more um, complex bridges. And again, they're still really easy to produce and easy to train on. Um, any questions about Bailey Bridges today? Or Bailey Bridges just in general? Well, here. Well, I'll take any more questions you have um, after this. But overall, the Bailey Bridge was probably the most important logistical innovation of World War II and is still one of the most underappreciated. Its ingenuity, flexibility, and capability marks it as one of the most decisive tools in the hands of Allied commanders. Um, could the war have been won without it? Probably. But as the Germans destroyed key bridges, um, as they were retreating east, the job of crossing those rivers and those bridges and continuing the advance without Baileys would have resulted in, in a drawn out war and a far bloodier war. Um, it's a very simple and humble tool, but where it lacks splashiness, um, it more than makes up for ineffectiveness. Um, you can actually, up here on the top, you'll actually see one of the Bailey bridges that was constructed um, by Allied forces in World War II. It is still standing. Um, and there was actually a bridge in the town right next to it, which they renamed the Tucker Bridge because um, Major Tucker, who was supervising the construction of this bridge, was uh, killed in the process. Uh, but yeah, any questions about Bailey Bridges? All right, sweet. Um, oh, that's me, by the way, circling me right there. All right, moving forward. So, improved ribbon bridges. I really appreciate you guys sticking with me this far. I know it's been long, but I hope you guys are enjoying this somewhat. Um, we're almost done. So, improved ri uh, ribbon bridges. We're going to talk about the float bridge, its operation, and we'll then we'll get into uh, uh, Russia's failed bridging operation. And then I'll take any questions, and then um, I'll show you the work side, and then that'll be done. So, the improved ribbon bridge is essentially an evolution of the pontoon bridges um, from World War II. They were capable. Of, uh, they the improved ribbon bridges are capable of carrying the weight of modern tanks and pretty much any armored vehicle that is in our, in our inventory. Um, I'm going to go over. I actually have two videos. Um, the first one is just about the construction. It's not too long. I'm going to be skipping through it a lot. These are the bridge erection boats. These will be put in the water and help kind of hold the bridge and move parts around. Moving forward, they're putting the boats in the water, nice and easy. All right, these are the bridge base. They're going to be backing these up, up into the water. Um, as you can see right here, they essentially back the truck up, up to like about right here, halfway through the second wheel. And um, what they'll do is the driver has a string attached all the way down here. There's a pin that holds the bay in place. What he'll do is he'll yank that cord and just accelerate, and the bridge will kind of just fall into the water and open up, as we'll see here. Yeah, the first boat here, it's going to have the build crew, uh, as well as the boat driver and pinman. What you'll see is the build crew going on, and you'll have the pinman get onto the bridge bay, and they'll tie off. They're getting, the build crew is going to get their equipment on, and they'll start locking all these little parts. Right there, that's a ramp. That's going to be an end piece for the bridge, and how you, you get vehicles onto it. Let's push forward a little bit. Right here, they're kind of locking the pieces together by twisting those, uh, I think they're called six, no, they're called T-bars, I apologize. Uh, let's see. All right, so they're going to get, they use, basically use ropes to kind of get them together. That was, he fell. Right here, you have, uh, I believe these are called the 60 bars. Essentially, you, the ramps are kind of low, so you'll put the 60 bars into the uh, ramp, and you'll kind of pull up. And then they'll take the T-bars and kind of screw the pieces together. All right. Let me just make sure there's nothing else we need to see here. Um, all right. So what they're doing right here, these are called rafting operations. Basically, they're not going to build a... Um, oh, these are pinmen, by the way. They handle these ropes. That is their main duty. And that's what I did while um, I was a bridge crew member. So essentially, rafting operations are basically where they don't construct a full bridge. 
they'll build like two or three middle bays and they'll have the end ramps and they'll basically load up vehicles take it across and come back and just go back and forth like that it's not as ideal but it's probably a lot safer in terms of just being as like a target and all right that's about it for this video any questions about the construction of bailey bridges All right, sweet. So what do you need to con conduct a float bridging operation? First off, you need intelligence, far shore intelligence. You, need, you can use drones, um, aerial reconnaissance, satellite imagery. Basically, you want to know what you're getting into. You'll also have uh, ground reconnaissance. So you'll get people ashore on the other, the far bank, uh, the, far, uh, the far shore, and you'll kind of scout out enemy defenses. This is vital. You need to know what you're going up against before you cross. Next is you need surprise. You need multiple Brit sites. If you remember in, Monte, in the Battle of Monte Cassino, they had multiple bridge sites. And remember this, because this is gonna be important later on. I keep multiple bridge sites. You need careful concealed movement. This is difficult because you're moving a lot of equipment. Um, you're gonna be putting boats in the water. You're gonna be exposed. It's difficult, but you need to try. Next, we have quick movement. You don't need extensive staging times you can't sit on the um, near shore and sit there and kind of organize things and get things ready you need to move quickly you need to plan ahead make sure units know what they're doing once they get to the bridge site and start going immediately next you have combat power bridging operations are extremely important and they only happen if it's necessary so if it's happening it's it's extremely valuable that it goes um it, it, it's base, It's very important that it goes well. So you, militaries are going to um, put a lot of resources into bridging operations. Um, you get air cover, whether it be Apaches or um, uh, jets, you count artillery fire, um, anti-air batteries, everything you need to conduct the bridge operation successfully, it will get. Um, you also need far shore security and a bridgehead. Now, um, I'll be going over into this a little bit more later on uh, when I talk about the Russians, but essentially what you need is to get units across as fast as possible. So as you're building the bridge, you're going to be making um, fairing operations. You're going to be using as many amphibious uh, vehicles that you have to get across. You're going to be putting infantry ashore using boats. You're going to be doing everything you can to make sure that the far shore is secure. Um, moving on, you have um, proper flow of materials. So basically, this is essentially goes to planning. Um, you want um, essentially proper spacing and traffic control behind the lines, and you need proper planning and good discipline. And this is going to be important as well later on. Um, one thing to add that I forgot to add. Um, oh, no, never mind. I got it. All right, cool. Any questions about bridging operations? All right, sweet. I was hoping this would be about 30 minutes and this is getting close to an hour and I really do apologize, but I hope um, you guys are getting something from this. So planning. Now the left image, that is an overlay that gives commanders kind of an estimate about how much combat power they can reasonably get across in a certain amount of time. Um, this gives them a far greater ability to plan combat operations um, as the bridging operation goes on. Now I want you to note that there in that plan on the left there are 12 bridging sites just another just remember that on the right here you have uh, an example of how a plan is made for the flow of vehicle traffic um, you have the assembly area right here this is where units would kind of gather and would be told where to go um, and basically non-essential units would be held here as combat units would be the first to cross um, there will also be an area for the tr uh, CBTs where um, and I'm not I'm not sure exactly where it, it'd be predetermined, but um, essentially they'd be ready uh, as needed. So if they need more bridge bays, they'll call more bridge bays. Uh, so again, this plan has four sites. So twelve, four. You need multiple bridge sites. Extremely important. Extremely important. All right. This next bit. So I'm going to be skipping through this a lot. So. Right here, you also obviously have the boat launch right here. 
and you'll see in a little bit that um, you'll see kind of far shore, um, I guess, uh, fire from armored vehicles, right? So training exercises like this are extremely important in understanding how you're going to suppress the other side um, of the wet gap. You get boats across just like this, put infantry right here and start pushing forward with as much combat power as you can muster and try to secure that far shore. Um, and this is obviously happening as you're building the bridge. All right, next we have, let's see, let me skip forward to 219. Um, I want to point out, this is actually a different way of doing it. So basically what happens is, um, what they'll do is, you'll back the truck up, and you'll kind of hit slam the brakes to kind of push the bridge bay in. It's a faster way, it's a little bit more risky, but it's a way to kind of improve the speed of how you're getting these bridge bays into the water. Um, as you're building the bridge bay, as I mentioned before, you're going to be conducting ferrying operations. So I'm going to skip forward here. Um, as you can see, they get as many armored vehicles across as possible. I want you to note here that they have armored vehicles, but they also have this thing right here. This is basically what was holding the uh, bridge bays. They're going to get this across and they're going to use it as an anchor point to hold the bridge steady once it's built. Um, but again, mo most important part is getting these armored vehicles across and give some combat power to the, to the uh, bridgehead. All right, next you have sling load. Now, this is important simply because you can basically get more bridge bays in in a faster amount of time. Um, obviously, you need air superiority for this. You can't just kind of do this um, without having control of the air, but it is a very effective way of getting these bridge bays into the water a lot quicker, um, especially if you're conducting fairing operations, which may kind of take up the um, the shore where you're supposed to deploy bridges. All right, and lastly, um, we got a few more parts here. Go to 456. All right, so they're going to be attaching both the pieces and kind of connecting the whole bridge right here. So this way they can get uh, armored vehicles and combat power across pretty cons consistently. Now I want to point out that bridges don't last. Um, very long, especially float bridges because they're big targets. Maximum, maybe they'll last like 48 hours, 72 hours. Um, you just essentially want to get far shore um, combat powers across to the far shore so they can start conducting their um, uh, combat operations. Right. Obviously, getting armored vehicles across the bridge and um, they'll continue to push across as literally as much as they can. You want to get as much combat power as fast as you can across. All right, that's pretty much about it. Anything, any other, or, uh, any questions about crossing operations and how uh, they fit into military strategy? All right, sweet. All right, we're into the last part of our um, presentation here. So we have Russia's failure. Now, here's the thing. The Russian plan was essentially to push across this river and surround the towns of Severodonetsk and Lysyshensk. Um, now, this is a pretty significant operation because you have strong Ukrainian forces here. So you want to get as many troops across as possible, right? Now, the first thing I want to point out here, um, and actually I'll, I'll go into this in a moment, but so May 6th, Ukraine received intelligence from the front line regarding a lot of movement uh, of Russian vehicles and troop movements. Um, May 7th, Ukrainian recon confirms those reports and basically offers potential crossing point, a potential crossing point. On May 8th, Russia begins the crossing operation, and May 9th, the bridge is pretty much partially destroyed and a bunch of Russian units are stranded across the river. Now, here's, here's the part that's crazy. They had one, one crossing point in order to conduct this operation. One crossing point is not going to get enough combat power across to successfully conduct this operation. Even if, if you could succeed with one comp, uh, crossing operation, 
is going to be a lot slower than if you had like two, three, maybe four, right? So again, as I've been saying through this, throughout this whole presentation, multiple crossing points. Now, this is the aftermath. You have a bridge here, obviously, similar to the uh, improved ribbon bridges. Um, multiple destroyed vehicles. And I want you to note just how clustered they are. Like, what is this? Like, I, 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 I've, I've looked at these pictures a lot. Um, and every time I see them, it just, it's, it's, it, it baffles me how they could be this incompetent. And this is what happens when you only have one crossing point. Um, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous and a giant failure. Um, if you want to get combat or power across, you need to have multiple crossing points because what's, what this is going to do is if you just have one, you know where they're going to land. The Ukrainians knew where the Russians were going to cross because there was only one. And once they knew that's where they crossed, they already had artillery power, power concentrated in that area. So as soon as you get people across, you're going to see that the Ukrainians allowed the Russians to cross before destroying the bridge. So now you have Russian forces stuck on the other side of the river, and this was a giant failure. Any questions about this clusterfuck? Sweet. All right. So review. What did they do well and what did they not do well? Well, intelligence, far shore intelligence, aerial ground reconnaissance. I The yellow is essentially what I cannot confirm they did. I don't know if they did it, and if they did, maybe they did a bad job, but they did not do a good job of it. Multiple bridge sites, they did not do that. Careful concealment of movement, they did not do that. Essentially, these two are connected. You can't conceal where you're going if you're, if you're basically telling the enemy, hey, we're probably going to cross at this one point. Quick movement, no extensive staging times. I don't know how long their staging time was. It doesn't seem to be too long, though from reports it could have been maybe like two days, which is too much. Um, combat power, air cover, none. Suppression of enemy artillery fire, none. Far shore security, they got troops across, but they didn't push far enough to do anything about it. Um, or protect their bridge, they weren't able to get enough combat power across because they only had one crossing points. Multiple avenues of deploying combat power. I didn't mention this before, but I'll mention it now. There are a lot of ways to get combat power across a river. Obviously, you don't want to just do it with one. Crossing operations are vital, but you can do it with helicopters, air assault. You can get combat power across multiple ways, and they did not do it. Proper floor materials. There were no unnecessary clusters of equipment. As we saw, there were plenty of clusters of equipment. Um, control of vehicle movement at staging areas and crossing sites. They, it just, it, overall, this operation was just an embarrassing failure. And I am just glad that I am not in the Russian military. So, where does this, where does this leave us? Modern bridging is here to stay. It is a vital part of combat engineers and always will be. Um, as long as there are rivers to cross and bridges that can be blown, bridging is here to stay. River crossings in particular have their place throughout history. Washington did it during their American Revolution. Um, even generals as far back as Alexander the Great utilized river crossings as a way to outflank and uh, maneuver. Recent shifts away from regional conflicts like in Iraq and Afghanistan um, is going to bring a focus back to bridging um, because it's just an important part of conventional warfare. Logistics will continue to be the heart and soul of a military campaign and bridging will play a significant role in maintaining logistical capacity in a conventional war. Um, bridging is just one of the most important engineering, combat engineering skills that a military could have. So. Um, I want to thank you guys for kind of sitting through this. I know it's been an hour. Um, I wasn't planning on it being an hour, but, um, does anyone have any final questions for me? Um, um on the, the longer the bridge, um, how does that work for, uh, like the counterbalance when they're pushing the bridge out? So essentially you want... You have here. Let me go back to the uh, slide. So essentially, you have the bull nose, right? Which is, hold on, let me. I can use this one right here, right? 
Um, you don't have any flooring on it. You just have the transoms and the panels um, and whatever you need to connect them. So the bull nose is going to be as light as possible. And then on this side, you basically use anything you have to just weigh this part down. It's pretty much like, um, what's it called? A uh, seesaw. So you basically sit on this side to keep this side from going down. Is there any like math to it or do you guys no, have just, a good guess? Just a good guess. Like, okay. Yeah, just an just a eyeball. Like I said, Bailey yeah, bridges are there. very simple. Um it, it's it's pretty easy to understand like what um how what you want. And essentially what what they did here is whatever stringers you need, which is the flooring. Um, you need for the rest of this bridge, you just stack that on here and that's going to be enough for the most part, for most okay. situations. That makes sense. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Oops, sorry. All right, sweet. Well, I want to thank you guys for sitting through my presentation. Um, obviously, I put a lot of work into it, but I want a... Um, I want to give you one more note. If you guys ever see or hear anything at some point in the future, or you already know um, that there were any factual inaccuracies in my presentation, please let me know um, so I can, you know, adjust the slides and just um, have a more accurate understanding. Um, though I have put in a lot of effort to make sure that my information was as accurate as possible. Um, I do have a works cited page. Um, so these are all the sources that I used for every inf all the information that I gave you. Uh, as, uh, you know, I didn't cite myself, but um, and I had some more some information as well. But these are basically everything that I used. Um, I also got images and some information from Twitter as well. From um, and these are their Twitter handles if you'd like to go follow them. Um, but that's all I have. You may now unmute. Good job, man. I really enjoyed it. Awesome.